Erin is our um, presenter tonight, and she joined, and I'm pretty much going to read it, the Bat Conservation International staff in 2019. She's currently managing, managing Bat Conservation International's community engagement programs. Erin double majored in wildlife conservation and entomology from the University of Delaware, received her master's in wildlife ecology from Caesar Kleberg Wildlife Research Institute at Texas A&M University in King School. She has a special affinity for pollinators and is excited to have the opportunity to focus on bats. Erin has more than 10 years of experience working as a wildlife biology and running environmentally focused volunteer programs. She is happiest working at the intersection of science, communication, and citizen empowerment. She loves working with volunteers and getting people excited about environmental stewardship and wildlife conservation. In her spare time, Erin enjoys gardening with native plants, playing the ukulele, hiking, reading, and being outside. Anyway, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you guys today um, a little bit about kind of BATS 101, just to uh, get you introduced to the topic, and then talk a little bit about this idea of gardening for bats, and then Trina is going to talk about some of the plant species in your area that are really wonderful plants for bats. So yeah, and this, I love this picture. This is a eastern red bat. As you can see, they're super cute and uh, very fluffy. The males have this kind of beautiful orangey red coat. And they are solitary tree roosting bats. Uh, they actually don't uh, roost in big colonies like some bats you'll see, like the, the colony behind me is in Texas, Rock and Cave. Um, but Eastern red bats really rely on trees and they eat a lot of insects that come off of our native plants. So it's a great example for this talk. So I work for Bat Conservation International. Um, for those that don't know about BCI, we have a very, very simple mission. Uh, we just want to end bat extinctions worldwide. And we're doing a lot of work in the US and in other countries as well to achieve that mission. And we were founded in 1982. So we just had our 40 year anniversary, which is really exciting. Yay, yay BCI. Um, and really when we started, there was kind of this overwhelming public perception, uh, negative public perception about bats. And I think some of that still exists in the world today, but it was really, really bad back in like the 80s. And BCI really wanted to change that perception and really focus on teaching people about bats and talking to people about why bats are important because they noticed a lot of populations were in decline for a lot of different reasons. Um, and we are based in Austin, but we actually have an office in DC now, as well as kind of people scattered throughout the country, as well as some in Canada and Mexico now. So we are truly international, which is very cool. And I made this video just to give you a sense of the diversity of bats. There's over 1400 species of bats in the world. So this will just kind of give you an idea of some of the different bat faces that are out there. And these aren't all species that we have in the US. I just really like to kind of show the different diversity of bats that are out there. <laughs> Some very interesting looking guys. And there's the fruit bats, which are the bigger ones. And then there's all different kinds. Some of them eat insects. Some of them, uh, I'm sure you've heard of vampire bats. There are a few of those. Uh, some are actually carnivores. They eat frogs and uh, things like that. And then some are nectar feeding bats and they're pollinators. That guy with the very wrinkly face is a fruit eating bat. So there's a lot of those as well. And that just gives you a sense of the amazing diversity over 1400 different species of bats in the world. Um, yeah, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, moving on. And so just to kind of bring it back home to the US, uh, about one third of the bat species in the United States are considered at risk or already um, threatened or endangered. And they're actually the most imperiled terrestrial vertebrates on the continent. And so it's just to kind of you know, further the point that a lot of bat species populations are, are in decline. There's a lot of different reasons for that. And they really, really need our help now more than ever. So, you know, if you take anything away from that, this talk tonight, just know that the bats need us and there's things you can do actually in your own backyard that will help them, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So bat basics, bats 101, here we go. So there's kind of five common bat myths that you've probably heard, and I'm just going to go through them really fast and kind of dispel them one by one. Uh, the first one is this idea that bats are blind. Uh, my grandma used to say all the time that she was blind as a bat, and that's a pretty common expression. I think this comes from the idea because bats are out at night, people kind of assume they, they can't see. I'm not quite sure, but bats can see about as well as you or I, which means they actually don't see very well at night, but they use what's called echolocation. 
which is using sound to navigate. And that's actually how they get around at night. So they are by no means blind. They actually see pretty well and they use echolocation at night, which is kind of an amazing superpower, which I'll talk more about in a second. So they are not blind. Uh, the second one, this is kind of more old school, but this idea that bats want to nest in your hair or want to get in your hair. Um, this is obviously not true. Bats roost in caves and trees, uh, under bridges sometimes, all sorts of different structures and habitats but not one of those is a human head. So they don't want to be in your head. Um, they can actually echolate, echolocate something as thin as one human hair. They're so good at it and they have that level of accuracy. So they're not going to crash into your head by mistake. So that's kind of a very old school myth that is not true. Um, the other one I hear all the time is that bats are rats with wings or this idea that they're kind of rodents or vermin. Um, bats are not rodents, which is the, the fam, the uh, yeah, the order that the uh, rodents and rats and mice and, and rabbits are in, rodentia, if you're going to get into taxonomy. Bats are in their own order called Chiroptera, which I'll get, I'll talk about more in a second. But they're actually more closely related to horses taxonomically than they are to rats and mice, which kind of blows my mind. But that's how it shakes out when you look at kind of the taxonomic order and all the DNA and things like that. So, and another really big distinction between bats and rodents is that Rodents have lots of babies all the time. They're always reproducing, which is kind of one of the reasons we consider them pests. Bats usually have about one pup per year. So they have a really, really slow reproductive rate. And it's, they're much, much different in that sense from rodents and things that we kind of consider you know, pest species. Um, the next one is that bats are vampire bats or all bats want to suck your blood or they're going to attack you. Uh, pretty common, especially the way that they're usually portrayed in movies and on TV and in media. Bats are usually kind of terrifying, looking like this with their little fangs. <laughs> so uh, as I said, there's over 1,400 species of bats in the world. Of those, there's only three that actually specialize on feeding on blood, so what we would consider vampire bats. Of those three, only one feeds on the blood of mammals. The other two actually feed on the blood of birds. Um, and they actually, they all live in Latin or South America. We don't have any here in the United States. And they, they actually will sneak up on their prey. They bite them. They have kind of a numbing agent in their bites. So the prey doesn't feel it. They have a kind of a, something that decoagulates the blood, kind of makes it flow. And then they lap the blood up like a little kitten. So they're not sucking blood. They're not attacking anything. It's very like kind of covert. They actually like will walk on the ground to sneak up on their prey, which is usually like larger mammals or sometimes livestock. And that's actually how they do it. So one out of 1400 plus species of bats is actually a mammal vampire bat. And we do not have them in the United States. And they're actually really cool. They have all sorts of interesting interactions. And because of science working with them, um, they've discovered a lot of interesting things related to blood thinners and, and other things that are really useful to people in terms of uh, helping them with some medical issues. So that's very cool. Uh, the last is this idea that all bats have rabies. Uh, I hear this all the time as well. Um, I think with this, you know, any mammal can have rabies and you want to just be really careful and use common sense. If you see a mammal that looks sick or it seems like it's a little off um, with bats, you know, sometimes, you know, they don't interact with humans very often because they come out at night and because they're very kind of secretive and cryptic. So if you see a bat during the day, there's a chance it could be a sick bat and you just wanna make sure you wear gloves, that you use common sense and you make sure you always tell kids, you know, not to pick up a bat. You just wanna be careful. Um, bats don't have rabies more than any other species of mammals, but they can get rabies like other mammals. So we just wanna be aware of it, but just know that, you know, they're not carrying rabies. All bats don't have rabies, things like that. So those are kind of my five common bat myths that I like to talk about. Now you guys are experts. All right, so as I said, they're mammals just like us. They give uh, birth to live young. The moms will feed their babies with milk. And you can see the wings of a bat are the same bones as in our arms. So you've got the same bones here and actually their wings are just their extended fingers with skin stretched between them. So they're kind of flying like this with their hands out, kind of doing jazz hands the whole time, which is amazing. And that's, they come from the order Chiroptera, which is just Latin for meaning hand wing. And now that totally makes sense, right? Because you can just see that their wing is just an extended version of kind of what we think of as our hand. And as I mentioned, bats do echolocation, which is a really amazing skill they've got. They will throw out sound. Um, and so bats are actually screaming all the time at night when they're looking for, for insects and other prey. 
And, but it's such a high frequency that we can't hear it with our ears, which is good because I think if, you know, if you're to near a large bat emergence or there's a lot of bats around, it would be very, very loud, but we can't hear it. So they're sending out sound and then the sound bounces off whatever they're looking for, say it's a moth or, or some other insect, and they actually are able to zero in on it using that echolocation ability. And so I've got a couple of cool videos. This is one, there's a spider right here in the middle. You'll see a bat flying in and then he changes course. He senses the spider. He's going in and grabbing it. And I'll play it one more time. It's very cool. So yeah, um, the spider had no chance. And actually use, you'll see he's kind of scoops it up with his tail. That's a really common way for bats to hold on to their insect prey. There you go. And then I've got another video. Can you guys hear that? I don't know if you'll be able to hear the sound, but basically up here, this is a moth. Um, and then a bat's gonna kind of come in and scoop it up. Does like a little flip. They're kind of like aerial acrobats. So there's the moth. Here comes the bat, woo. So they're really, really amazing at this ability. And just to give you a sense of the diversity, the biggest bat in the world is the giant golden crown flying fox. They are about three pounds in weight. They have a wingspan of about six feet, which is pretty darn big. They're only found in the Philippines and they are, one of, they are the largest bat species in the world. And then if you go to the smallest bat species in the world, it's called the bumblebee, bumblebee bat or the kitty's hognose bat. These guys are about three centimeters long. They weigh about two grams and they're just super, super tiny. And they're actually critically endangered, unfortunately, but. As you can see by this picture, they are so small compared to this giant flying fox. So lots of diversity in the bat world. So bats are important for a lot of different reasons and I'm just gonna go through this really fast. This could be a whole talk in itself. Um, but just to give you kind of the highlights of what bats do for us and for the ecosystem. One thing our bats, pretty much most of the bats in the United States are insectivorous, meaning they all eat insects. We don't really have a lot of pollinating bats. We do have some kind of in the South Southwest of our country, but generally most of our bats eat insects. So they're really important for pest control. Um, they eat a lot of things that we consider pests to ag crops, to our gardens. Um, a study came out a couple of years ago that estimated that bats save farmers about $23 billion annually by preventing crop damage and you know, preventing the use of pesticides as well. So they make our food cleaner, which is fantastic. So they do a, a really wonderful service with pest control. And it's something that would be almost impossible to recreate without the help of bats. So we should really thank them for that. And they definitely eat mosquitoes too, which I get asked that question all the time. They eat lots and lots of mosquitoes, which is okay with me. So bats are also really important pollinators too. Uh, this is a picture of a lesser long-nosed bat, which is one of the few pollinating bats that is found in the Southwest US. Um, they pollinate about 500 different species of economically and ecologically important plants. One of those is the agave plant. So they are the sole pollinators of agave. So if you do like tequila and you like margaritas, thank a bat for it because we would not have that without bats pollinating our agave, which is great. And they also pollinate some of the wild types of, of some of our really most favorite kind of crop fruits. So what I mean by wild types is, you know, they'll be growing a bunch of bananas on a banana plantation, but you know, all those bananas are gonna be genetically identical. And if there's some sort of issue with a fungus or some sort of disease, all the, if all those bananas die, it's really good to have ones that are growing wild to kind of insert some genetic diversity into that population. And bats are the pollinators of the wild bananas as well as guavas and mangoes and all sorts of things. So they're really important pollinators for a lot of the world. And I have a pic, another video. Uh, this is a bat, you can see the pollinating bats have really long tongues, which is how they get that nectar. So imagine this is a flower and this is, imagine this is a flower and this is nectar at the bottom. See this bat's coming up. See, it gets way in there. So they're really efficient pollinators because they get covered with pollen. And then see his tongue comes out and he slurps it up kind of like a straw, gets that nectar, and then goes on to the next flower. So bats are really efficient pollinators. Okay, oops. And the last thing I'll talk about is bats are really important for seed dispersal as well. There's a ton of species of bats that eat fruit. We don't have any fruit eating bats in the US, but there are lots in other parts of the world especially in areas of rainforest where they've been clear cut for 
a variety of different reasons. A lot of times these areas, they take a really long time to get reforested because a lot of wildlife, they're not going to cross this because it looks, you know, it's super dangerous. They're very exposed, but fruit bats will fly across at night and they've eaten a bunch of fruit. So when they deposit their guano, which is a fancy word for bat poop, you know, while they're flying, it's got seeds of the fruit that they've eaten and they, they form these kind of new colonies of, a kind of pioneer plants and trees, which is what you call the first things that sort of grow in this area. So about 95% of new growth in clear cut areas of rainforest is due to fruit bats uh, spreading the seeds of different fruit and trees that they eat, which is great. They do a lot of wonderful work in that way. All right, so I was gonna talk really fast, oops, about some of the bats in your area, um, meet your local bats. So you have about 13 species approximately, which is pretty great. Uh, this is one of them, the hoary bat, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, one of the most common bats in your area is the big brown bat, which is this cute little guy here. They are found all over the place. Um, they're brown, <laughs> very descriptive name. They're larger. There's also a little brown bat. They are bigger than the little brown bat. Um, they form maternity colonies and bat houses. So if you do know of an occupied bat house in your area, it's probably big brown bats. They love to eat beetles, especially spotted cucumber beetles, which is a very common garden and ag pest too. So we love big brown bats. They're super common in the US. You can see their range is kind of this, the whole, uh, whole United States is, is colored in because they're kind of found everywhere, which is great. Another one is this Eastern red bat, which I talked about in the beginning. You can see there's a Western red bat. Uh, so this is the Eastern red bats range. And then it takes over as the Western red bat kind of going West. They are very handsome tree loving bats. Um, they are migratory bats. So they tend to kind of move through an area. So you might get more of them in the spring and fall as they're kind of moving North or South. Um, they live alone and the moms will usually give birth to one pup, but sometimes, which is pretty common for bats, but sometimes an Eastern red bat will have up to four to maybe even five pups, which is really unheard of in any other bat species. They, the mom will actually, she has four nipples on her front and she will be feeding all four of the pups at the same time. And if she has five, she has to take turns. So uh, Eastern red bat moms are, are really fierce and really amazing and they are able to support a lot of babies compared to other bats. Um, they eat a lot of moss and beetles, but they will kind of eat any kind of bugs. And if you see a bat kind of coming out first thing during at night, right at dusk, it's often one of these guys because they like to come out first thing um, right at that time. And the evening bat, this is another one that's really common. You can see it's found in a lot of uh, this part of the country. They are you know, they'll occupy bat houses as well. They are small and brown. They really like dead bark of trees. So if you have a dead tree in your yard or a snag and you can leave it up, that's actually really fantastic evening bat habitat. Um, so that's something people often don't think about as dead trees being important for wildlife, but they really, really are. And then the hoary bat, which is one of my most favorite bats, they are called hoary bats because their kind of pelage or, or fur re resembles hoar frost, which is this stuff. You can see it kind of has that look about it. Uh, these guys are some of the biggest bats in the United States. They are solitary roosters as well. They're migratory. And unfortunately they have a lot of issues with um, being struck by wind turbines. Um, and that's kind of an issue with certain species of bats, but hoary bats especially are experiencing kind of a big population decrease based on wind turbines specifically. And we're trying to figure out what's going on with that. BCI has a whole kind of wind energy group that's working on that right now. Um, and these guys will eat, if there's lots of mosquitoes in an area, they will eat them all. They love, love, love mosquitoes. So I love, love, love hoary bats. And then the last one I wanted to mention is the Indiana bat. It's an endangered bat that is found only in three states, one of those being Kentucky. Um, they are heavily impacted by human disturbance and kind of people going into caves and other roosts and really disturbing them. They were actually the first bat in the United States to be listed as endangered. Um, and so we're still kind of figuring out why their populations are declining, but I think it's just a loss of roosting habitat all over based on urbanization and other factors. But these are endangered bats found in your area, so it's always good to know. All right, so enough of that. How can you help bats? So Trina is going to talk about this more, but I just wanted to kind of give you a general idea of what gardening for bats means. 
it's very much uh, like planting a pollinator garden or a garden for monarchs. You just want to put in native plants, obviously, because they attract the native insects that our bats love to eat. So think about things that attract insects, especially things that attract insects later in the day and at night. So things that are really fragrant or even, I dare say, stinky, attract lots of bugs. That's fantastic. Um, things that don't close their flowers at night, like most trees don't close their flowers at night. Other flowers, you know, open their flowers later in the day or kind of like right around dusk. So those night bloomers are really fantastic. Things that are lighter colored, like white or pink or yellow, seem to attract a lot of moths and beetles, nighttime pollinators too. Those are fantastic. Um, you can get really into moth host plants because uh, moths are really common bat food. And if you think about it, you know, this moth has a lot more energy in it than one tiny mosquito. So, you know, if there's lots of moths around, bats are going to be pretty excited to eat them. So if you if you get really into moth host plants, you can start planting those as well. And then also our garden plants too. If you have a garden and it's organic, a lot of things that are pests to your garden are things that bats really like to eat as well. So you can kind of supplement your garden with some native plants. You can put in a garden. All of that's really good as long as it's kind of practicing organic gardening. And then I get a lot of questions about bat houses too. Bat houses are great if you're trying to bring bats into your yard or you want to provide some habitat to bats. I would say if you have a bunch of trees, then you're already doing great. You probably have bats in your yard and don't even realize it. Um, with bat houses, there's a lot of bad bat houses out there. So you want to make sure you're buying a good bat house. And um, if you go to Bat Conservation International's website, it's just batcon.org. We have a lot of information about bat houses, what kind is appropriate. You can build your own, you can buy one. Um, we recommend the three to four chamber ones. The larger ones are definitely more successful. If somebody tries to sell you some sort of, sort of like, you know, bat pee or anything that they say will attract bats to your bat house, that doesn't work. Not at all. It's a total scam. Don't buy it. Um, and then you're, oh, sorry, this is South Carolina. I need to update this slide. <laughs> but yeah, for your area, you're going to do kind of a medium to darker shade of paint. Um, like in Texas, where I am, you need a light shade of paint because you want it to kind of deflect as much sunlight as possible. But you know, where it's not as hot as here, you want a darker shade. And there's lots of information about this on our website. And then installing it is also kind of, there's a lot of nuance involved. And you know, you could put it up somewhere for a couple of years and it may not be occupied. And then you just try a different spot. There's really kind of nothing you can do to make the bats come. You just kind of hope you put it in a spot that they like. And sometimes they're a little bit picky. But you want to make sure it gets at least six hours of sun a day. Keep it 20 to 30 feet from a nearest tree. If you put it on a tree, that's not great because it does bring in predators and makes them really vulnerable. And they also need a lot of distance from the ground because when they come out, they swoop down. So about 12 to 20 feet is really good. And then water and patience. So much patience because sometimes it takes a while for them to get occupied. And you know, if you're not sure if your house is occupied or not, you can always just kind of look down at the underneath the house and see if you have guano. If there's guano there, there's definitely bats and then you don't have to disturb them. And then other things to think about um, when you're helping bats in your yard, this idea of vertical layers, which I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with. Even if you don't have a big space, you can create a lot of kind of different habitat with kind of different types of plants kind of working all the way up. And, you know, that provides more habitat for different insects, which is great for, in, for the bats as well. And then kind of the larger trees are great as roosting habitat too. And then as I mentioned, if you can leave the dead trees up and it's not a safety hazard, that's absolutely fantastic because it provides roosting habitat for some species of bats, but it also attracts a lot of insects as well. And then just general, general tips, uh, keep it organic, keep, put your cat indoors. Uh, if you can't do it all the time, at least put it in at night. We definitely have heard of cats eating bats at night, especially if they get to know where the bats are roosting or kind of where they hang out. And then, um, if you can, if you live in kind of more of an urban area, you want to try to keep your yard as dark as possible. Since there's so much light pollution anyway, you know, the more light, the harder it is for bats to use their echolocation. They're not as effective at it. So if your yard is darker, that definitely makes it more bat friendly. And then oh, a lot of people ask me about water. Uh, you can't, unfortunately, if you put a bird bath out there, it's not going to matter for the bats. They need about seven to 10 feet of water because they actually swoop down and drink on the wing. Um, so if you have a pond, that's great. As long as it doesn't have too much vegetation on it. Or if you live near a creek or, or a lake or anything like that, that's fantastic. But unfortunately, it's a little bit more difficult providing bats with water um, in your yard. 
And then this is something I'll share. I'll send this to you, Trina, but we actually created a guide to gardening for bats, which I'm really excited about. We just put it out. And if you do scan this QR code, it should take you to the PDF, but I'll also send it to you as well if you wanna share it with everybody. And it's just super general, kind of the, some of the guidelines I just talked about. But um, yeah, we're gonna update our website soon with more gardening for bats uh, information. And then the last thing I always say, if you want to help bats, just be a bat advocate, advocate, advocate. Uh, tell everyone, you know, why they're great, why they're important, why they're interesting and why they're valuable. I think the more people out there talking about bats and, and kind of demystifying them and explaining them and just being bat fans, the better. And now you guys already know, now you're all experts on bats. So hopefully you'll go out there and spread the love. I uh, went to a talk several years ago about bats, and um, at that time they said that rocket boxes were the most like most used bat house type. Is that still the case? Yeah, so they're a little bit harder to find and also harder to build, but they are great. Yeah, we just kind of we mainly recommend the four chamber one now, just in terms of like it's it's a lot easier to make and it's not as complicated but if you can build a rocket box it attracts it'll actually provide house for more bats it, the rocket box generally will hold like 300 to 400 bats and the the chambered bat houses is usually like 200 so you can actually get a fairly large colony in there um but yeah they're they're harder to buy too if you're like looking to buy a bat house it's harder to find rocket boxes but they're great i love that you know that that's awesome well they have to be mounted on a pole right that's mm -hmm. like yeah, so yeah, with the rocket boxes, they're usually on a pole. And then um, for the other kind of bat houses, we always, you can put those on a pole too, but we recommend putting them against your house if you can or a building, because then they kind of, the temperature stays more regulated. So these are native plants that feed the insects that feed bats. Um, and the first one is Black Eyed Susan, Rebecca Fulgita. And you can see that it's on this issue, this one. Um, the habitat is moist and open woods and fields, and that is if you're going to see it out in the wild. But if you want to plant it in your yard, um, gardening wise, it blooms in July through October, likes sun to moist soil one to three feet tall. Distinctively, Rebecca feed dozens of caterpillars. Um, it's a favorite of butterflies. Seeds are eaten by birds. Um, so you also can plant it just for that reason, besides that it feeds the insects, feeds bats. And also the nurseries are listed um, that you can buy and that drop seed grow wild and grow wilder. Um, and if we're going too fast, just let me know. Um, so this is Joe Pieweed, used to be Eupatorium capurium and Pistillosum is now Eutrochium. Um, I love Joe Pieweed. Um, this is one that's shorter. It grows in open woods and you can often see it in ditches um, in the late summer um, and early fall, July through September. It grows in sun to moisture, dry soil, three, six, six, three to six feet tall. Um, things that make it distinctive is it feeds dozens of caterpillars, it's attracted to lots of butterflies, solitary bees, bumblebees, and other pollinators. It's shorter and can take drier soil. And the leaves, which I've never done this, have a vanilla-like odor when they're bruised. Um, but it's a very attractive plant with the mauve head. Um, and all these plants are actually very attractive um, in, your, in your landscape. Um, so this is foam flower, which is still blooming at my house. Um, is rich wooded slopes, cool, moist, and rocky woodlands, deciduous woods, stream banks, and moist cracks and granite cliffs. So you often see it hanging off of um, cliffs and stuff. Blooms in April through June, sun to partial shade and rich moist soil, and it's six to 12 inches tall. Um, it tends to be an evergreen ground, evergreen ground cover, and it can spread by slender runners. It's not aggressive. Um, and its flowers are visited by small bees and surface flies um, and butterflies. And I do list all the books where I've gotten this information for, from at the end. And, and honestly, if you have trouble finding any of these plants, just let me know and I can also help you find them. Um, purple cone flower, Echinacea purpurium, which I've only ever seen blooming in the wild once, um, but it may have been planted. Um, in, in the wild, it grows in wooded slopes, dry open woods and fields. Blooms in June through July, sun to moist soil, soil three, to six, three to five feet tall, um, has 12 to 20 purple droopy rays. Birds eat the seeds in the fall, and it's an excellent plant for butterflies and bees. Um, and you'll often see a lot of pollinators on it. Um, and that was a wonderful picture of a field of it. Um, 
Foxglove beer tongue has just started blooming. Um, and this is our Pinstemon digitalis. It's most of them what's in fields, and I often see that on sides of the road, um, on, like on a slope and stuff. It blooms May through July and sun to shade and moisture dry soil, two to five feet tall. So that would let you know that this is, you can grow it any habitat you have, from sun to shade to moisture dry soil. This is one that hummingbirds like. It's easy to transplant. Um, it's frequent in Kentucky. Small and medium bees, wasps, and three species of bumblebees and five moth species enjoy the blooms. These be the babies of the common buckeye butterfly, which is one of the few butterflies I can actually reliably identify. So I really like the common buckeye. So. And golden rods in any solid dago will feed um, the insects that feed bats. Um, Ringle leaf golden rod is one, the solid dago rugosa. It may be a little bit more aggressive than you might would want to have. Um, it, it does more like mass plantings, but any solid dago goldenrod you want, from sun to shade and want it to dry soil, you can find a goldenrod. Um, Y'all will see it, of course, in clearings, fields, dry, moist, open woods and thickets, because it just makes a yellow um, haze in July through October. Sun to shade and wet to dry soil, two to six feet tall. It provides abundant, reliable nectar and pollen in late summer for wasps, beetles, flies, lots of butterflies, large and small bees. I did not know this, but it's the most important late season pollinator plant, um, which helps things that are going to be migrating or going, um, depending on how they overwinter, if they're going dormant and stuff. Um, it's one of the one things that y'all want to try and put up um, as all day go. And you can find one that would be clump forming and that won't take over and it's attractive um, also. And the white yarrow, Acrofolium, you know, Achillea mammothelium. It is native and it's also introduced. Um, the Kentucky native plant book says it's introduced. The Tennessee one says it's introduced and also here natively. Um, it blooms in May through November and sun to wet to dry soil in one to three feet tall. Um, did not know this, but several cavity nesting birds, such as bluebirds and chickadees, use narrow blind their nests, which seems to inhibit the growth of parasites, and it feeds many insects and lots of moths, caterpillars, and beetles. Um, and it also has a medicinally smell and stuff. And you might have some trouble finding it, but I mean, hopefully local nurseries will have it, or that you know we can have y'all find a, a place. Online, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the North American Native Plant Society, because I belong to there, put a thing about it, this, which I just got this month, and then they put it for the native insects use common yarrow for its nectar and pollen and developing caterpillars eat the leaves. Um, but they also didn't say that you can buy it. Um, so these are our trees and shrub part. So that was the plant part, the herbaceous plant. Um, Cyrex americana, American snowbell, also called Sterex, is just gorgeous if you see it. Um, grows by streams and borders, wetlands in West Tennessee. Um, blooms in April through June in part in sun to part shade, wet to moist soil, three to 12 feet tall. It's a showstopper when in bloom, has a nice sweet fragrance. It offers early nectar to diverse pollinators. Um, and it's a beautiful shrub, especially for a focal point. Um, in blooms about the same time as um, red bud and dogwood um, and the service berry. Buttonbush, Cephalanthus occidentalis, um, moist soils along streams and in floodplains uh, flood in Kentucky and Tennessee. I've seen that near the lake, um, Alder Green Lake, blooms in June through August. Full sun in wet to moist soil, and it can be three to 30 feet tall. Um, I have it um, in my property because I have floodplains on my property. Um, fragrant blooms, waterfowl and birds enjoy its seeds. It's attracted to butterflies, it forms thickets and can be cut to the ground. It also is easily transplanted. Um, so you can also um, dig it up and move it and stuff. Um, Cause I was given lots of them by Janine um, Buttonbush, yeah. So this is the elderberry, uh, which some people think is too weedy. Um, it's Sambucus canadensis, common in Kentucky and Tennessee, woods, moist fields on the roadside and along streams. Deer don't seem to eat it because um, it's left on my property with, you know, I've got Bambi and her twin ponds, they don't seem to eat it. Blooms in April through August, sun to shade, moist to dry, to wet. So like 
the fox glove instant man. It's ubiquitous. You can draw, you can, whatever you got, you'll have some to shade, moisture wet to dry soil, you can grow elderberry. It's four to 20 feet tall. It will grow into thickets. It's highly valued food for the wildlife. Birds and mammals eat the fruit in June through October as showy blooms and deer tend not to eat it. Um, and supposedly you can make whistles from the stems. I've never done that, but I've heard you can. Um, I've never seen nine bark in the wild. The Physocarpus opulifolius is alongside streams and our rocky slopes, blooms in May through July, in some with moist to dry soil, three to 10 feet tall. It does have winter interest with the bark peeling off in long papery strips. It's, it's beautiful when it blooms. Birds and small mammals eat the seeds. Um, wild hydrangea, hydrangea arborensis. You will see this often in ditches, especially if there's cliffs and stuff. It's also stream banks, moist cool forests, and rich well drained soil, might shade. Flowers in May through July, it prefers shade and moist soil, it's three to six feet tall. Um, it's um, an humble kind of flower, and the flowers and seeds are eaten by turkey, and it tends to be more of a subtle accent in the shade garden. It doesn't tend to be really repowering, it doesn't tend to spread, but it makes a very nice bloom um, in the spring. Um, Black willow, which I have on my property because um, Salix nigra, because I have floodplains. It grows in Kentucky and Tennessee in floodplains along stream banks, low moist areas. It tends to be short lived, it's 80 to 100 feet tall. It's used for erosion control because it's a rapid grower and it has a dense root system that stabilizes the soil. Um, and it also is one of the earliest blooming plants for pollinators, um, more than I realized that. Um, and also it feeds, I think like a hundred some odd butterfly caterpillars. Um, Doug Talmy's book lists black willow is like the third or fourth um, best plant to, to feed caterpillars, to feed the moths and butterflies. So oaks, um, this is the white oak, Crocus alba, any white, any oak, any oak feeds over 500 caterpillars. So anything you want from sun to shade to wet to dry soil, you can find an oak to fit that. Um, the white oak's habitat is moist, warm, western and southern slopes in association with hickories and other oaks. I cannot identify oaks, so I have no idea if I've ever seen it. It grows in full sun to parched shade and well-drained moist soil. It's 50 to 80 feet tall. It tends to be slow growing and it's long lived. This white oak is wider than its height, tends to be pyramidal, pyramidal, oh, I can't even say that, when young. Nuts are highly valued by animals, can take dry soil. It's a magnificent shade tree, winter staple for many birds. It has a beautiful rich red fall color and it provides cover and nesting materials. So as you can see there, it's a landscape tree. I mean, it's huge, um, but it is very slow growing and very long lived. Um, the chicken pen oak, and I did the oaks that were listed in the nurseries. So this is Crocus Moonbergi. Um, likes limestone outcrops and calcareous soils, grows well drained, moist soil, 40 to 50 feet tall. So it tends to be a smaller oak if you don't have a lot of property um, and you wanna do more of a, you know, you don't have a lot of acreage. It's used in landscaping for its size. It has glossy leaves and longevity. It's really fast growing. It has some drought tolerance. And you can see there um, that it's not a huge tree. Um, so it tends to be more of a tree that you would use um, if you were space challenged. Um, so this is the burr or mossy cup, mossy cup oak, Crocus macrocarpa. And it likes field and forest, poorly drained ball and wind sites to dry slopes, primarily calcareous soils. Grows slowly in shade to sun and moisture dry soil. So that means, of course, you can throw, throw it anywhere because you're gonna have sun or shade or moisture dry soil, 70, 85 feet tall, very adaptable. Has large acorns and the mossy fringed cup because I saw pictures of that. And those quirky projections along the branches and has a very coarse winter appearance, which I guess you can see there what it is as far as the landscape goes um, and shade tree. And the shingle or laurel oak, Perkis in precaria. Um, does mesic riverbanks and bottomlands, grows in shade and moist soil, and it also is only 50 to 70 feet tall, so it's not a very large tree. It tends to be rounded or oblong corn crown. Shiny, leathery, elliptical leaves resistant to the winter. Acorns count. Um, 
Acorns are an important food for deer, turkey, and acorns. And the shiny elliptical leaves persist into the winter. And the shimar, or the cricket shimardia, which you can tell the fall color there is pretty. Woo. It's mesic upland forests and bottomlands and limestone ridges. Grows in rich, moist, well drained soil in full sun, 50 to 80 feet tall. So again, it's not as much as a tree that's going to dominate your landscape. Glossy leaves turn reddish in the winter. Is tolerant of drought and wet soil. Grows quickly. It's a good shade tree. Acorns are eaten by the wild turkey, Carolina wren, woodpeckers, and mammals. And these are the nurseries that do um, the trees and shrubs and the plants that I mentioned. And then also, that's uh, all. okay. Oh, you didn't list my books? I didn't have them. Oh, okay, so, okay, sorry. <laughs> so I have a list of books too, if y'all wanted to see where I got all the information from, yeah. And um, this is on the website and on the, um, the event page for tonight's talk. You can find this document and all these, mostly they're in here because their host plants are useful to moths and insects that feed bats in general. Well, thank you, Erin, so much. We really appreciate this. I did not yeah. know that. Wow. You're very welcome. I mean.